Alright, well it is 10.31, I'm going to get started with the lecture. Um, well, we got about less than half the class here, but it's okay, I'm going to get started anyway. There was a little bit discussion earlier of you know what to do with people who stream in a little bit late, like for the next half hour or so. <laughs> so unless those people are distracting you, I'm not going to do anything about it. If, it is, if they're distracting you, you can let me know by email. And then I'll you know, send out a, an announcement and let people know that you know, they have to be here on time or I'll lock the door. <laughs> so if they're distracting you and bothering you, that's what we'll do. If not, you know, it's not my responsibility. I was talking to, uh, oh, no, that person is not here. I was talking with another student this morning and go like, you know, if somebody is you know, pointing a shotgun at his or her own foot, I would you know, do the moral thing and go like, you probably don't want to do that. You might lose your toes and your foot. But if that person goes like, yeah, I know, but I still want to do it, then I would just step away and cover my ears and go like, okay, go ahead, do it now. Maybe you'll hide behind something. Huh? I would want to hide behind something in case. Yeah, in case you have ricochet and stuff like that, right? Yep. In other words, I'm not going to take that shotgun away from that person. <laughs> and say you cannot shoot yourself. No, you can shoot yourself. Just don't make sure no other person gets shot in the process. <laughs> that is that is your choice. You can you can turn around. You can keep watching it. You can video the whole thing. You know, live stream it to the internet. You know. <laughs> but I would still give that person a warning. It's like that may not be a very good idea. This may happen to you. You know, show a picture of a person without a foot. Okay, and if that person goes like, yeah, I know, but I still want to do it. Okay, your foot. Alrighty, so what we'll do today is we'll talk about those modules. Uh, we'll talk about uh, MUX, DMUX, and memory today. Then we'll have all the components that we need to look at the design of a processor, or you know, a particular toy processor that I have designed at this point. Are there any questions about the homework assignment before we start with the lecture? Yes. I just want to clarify, you didn't want any other output besides the, the seven... Segment display. Segment display that right? is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's the only actual observable output, um, unless I click on one of the wires and then I can look at the status of the wire. Yep. Okay. Any other questions related to the homework assignment? Okay. Homework assignment question. Yep. So go ahead. We're not naming the file. Our name anymore. No, we it doesn't say anything. Somewhere. Yep, so there's no need to name it in a particular way. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. But good question to ask. We don't need to like on the program. Nope. Mm -mm. Okay. But that's a good question. Um, so what we'll do is we are going to read the documentation in Logisim. I don't know how many of you may have done this already. We we'll just do unzip the jar file. You get to the HTML documents. Then you can either print it out or just have a browser, use a browser to look at those. If you haven't done it, it's okay. You know, you don't have to do it. Can you just save huh? the file and put it on the Sorry? Can you, uh, you can just move that and upload the canvas. Yeah, we can. But you can also just unzip it too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think I log put it into Logisim. And then we go to document, uh, en, go to HTML, and then just take a look at the index HTML. Okay. The nice thing, you know, so as far as I'm concerned with this, is you know I can zoom in and I can zoom out. I can control how things are displayed. So we'll start with, um, okay, what do you guys want to start with? Mux, or do you want to start with memory, RAM? <coughs> Multiplexers? Okay, we'll do multiplexers. So when you look at a picture of a multiplexer, it's basically a switch. So in this particular case, we have a MUX that has four inputs and one output. In other words, with most of these diagrams in Logisim, the convention is the left-hand side are inputs, the right-hand side will be the output. Okay. So this time we have four inputs and one single output. And remember, this is almost like a railroad switch. 
which means there are four ways to enter this particular thing, but only one way to get out. And what you're controlling is which input connects to the output. Is that okay? So if you want to look at a pictorial version of this, it is basically you have four, four tracks coming in, and then you have one track going out. So you're controlling this thing here. Am I connecting to here? Am I connecting to here? Am I connecting to here? Or am I connecting to here? So that's basically what you're controlling. But it's unidirectional. You can only come in through this way, and you can go out through this way. So when you look at this picture, you know, that explains what is on the left-hand side, or, you know, Logisim likes to refer to directions, like compass directions. So that explains what is to the west, and also what is to the east. What about these two in the middle? The gray dot is always on top of the control signal. In other words, that is the signal that controls, oh, should I connect to the top, which is called track zero, the second one, which is track one, track two, or track three. That's what the gray dot is. So the gray dot is not a single bit. How many bits do you need to specify 0, 1, 2, or 3? Two bits, very good. So the gray dot in this particular case is representing a port that has two control bits. 0, 0 would connect the output to input 0. 0, 1 would connect to the second one, and so on. What about the, the other one? Okay, what about this dot over here? This is an optional enable. In other words, you can make this whole thing so that it does not connect. So you can have something with a gray dot, but when that enable is turned off, this device does not drive the output, which allows for a multi-drop type of setup, because when this device is not driving what, whatever is connected to the output, something else can. And then you end up with no bus fight. Is that okay so far? Does that explain what a MUX does? Okay, all right, so the next thing we're gonna do is to talk about a DMUX. So by the name of a DMUX, it is called a demultiplexer, and it looks exactly the same as a MUX, except it is a mirror image, left, right, rever reversed. So in this case, you have one single input to the device, and then you have four output from that device. You still have a gray dot to select the input should now connect to zero, one, two, or three as the output. And you also have the other dot to the south, which is also enabled. So once again, if zero, zero is what this particular port under the gray dot is selecting, then the input is connected to output zero. If this gray dot is zero, one, then we have the input connecting to output one, and so on. It's exactly the same as this picture except you reverse the directions. Is that okay with uh, the explanation of what is a D multiplexer? So this blue dot, if the blue dot to the south is a zero, then none of the output is driven. They're all left floating and somebody else can drive those lines. If this particular blue dot is a one, that means you know one and only one is going to be driven and is connected to the input. Is that okay? All right. So we got a MUX and a DMUX done. Now, when I look at the notes, you know, I kind of lied because there's also a decoder that I have to explain. But when you look at decoder, what does it look like? It looks like a demultiplexer because it is a demultiplexer. Well, how come there's no input? Well, if there's no input, it means it is in, it is always connected to some constant, okay? What do you think the constant is going to be? Yep, the constant is 1. So a decoder is like a demultiplexer, always connected to a 1 for the input. But all of the other signals are the same, okay? Do you want to connect the implicit 1 to output 0, 1, 2, or 3? That's the job of the gray dot. The gray dot selects which output is driven to be a 1, and then the rest are guaranteed zero in this case. So one and only one of the output is going to be a one. The rest are zeros when, depending on what you specify with the gray dot. On the other hand, if the blue dot to the south is a zero, that means all outputs are left unconnected, or they're all zeros. None of them is, has a one. 
So in a way, it is kind of like a demultiplexer, but it also has some, some special meanings to it. Are we doing okay so far with a demultiplexer? Yep. So it's probably too early to ask, but what would be a good use for a decoder? A good use of a decoder is to convert some kind of input, like 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, into, you know, which line of the output is a 1. It's kind of like let me let me see if I can uh, make an analogy out of this. We'll we'll see this in the in the processor too. So we'll we'll, we'll take a look at the actual application <coughs> once we got the uh, the other module, which is the memory, also discussed. Okay. Have we talked about the RAM or how it operates in this class? Nope. Okay. So we'll, that's our next component to explain. So once again, I'm just referring to the notes you know, or the. Yep. Is this being recorded? I believe so. Yep. It's being. It's streaming. And let's see. OBS says the screen is being recorded and the sound is good too. Which is weird because the other classroom just did not work at all. I couldn't even get it to boot completely. So there's some change to that computer that I that I'm not aware of, probably. Okay, so we move on to memory module and we go to RAM this time. Okay, random access memory. So with a random access memory, it looks like ROM. Okay, in many ways, but it's not exactly like ROM either. So we'll explain all of these ports first you know, on paper, and then we'll put one into LogiSim, and then we'll try it out and have some fun with it. OK, so we have A, which, is, which serves exactly the same purpose as the A port in a ROM. It, all it does is to specify A location in the memory. Okay? So the width of A, the number of bits of this particular port, determines how many locations are addressable inside the module. If A is 8 bits, which is the default when you make a memory module, it means how many locations do we have? 8 bits can address how many locations? 256. 256, very good. Okay, so we can go from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. So that will give us 256 addressable locations. Um, you can change A to 9 bits, you can change it to 7 bits, you know, just like ROM. D is also the same thing, or almost the same thing, as the D port in a ROM. It is used to um, output the content of, a part of whatever location is addressed. But, because this is RAM, what is the one conceptual difference between a ROM and a RAM? It can change, exactly. So the content of RAM can change <coughs> during runtime. Now the content of ROM can change too, but not when the thing is already deployed. Okay, so that means this particular D port is no longer output only. It, is, it can also serve as input. When you look at the D port of a ROM, it is output only because you know, the content cannot change. But in this case, because you can also change the content inside a RAM module, this particular D port can be an input as well. In other words, something else can specify the content and drive this particular D port so that this particular RAM module can store that content into one of its locations. This particular thing, SEL, is also in the ROM. It is select, also known as chip select in industry. And it basically just says, okay, should this particular chip pay attention at all? If cell is zero, it means the chip is not paying attention at all. It is not driving any of those lines. If cell is a one, that means the chip is paying attention. It can potentially drive the data port, but not always, depending on the other pins. Now we have some other pins. This pin is easy to explain because it is also in a register. It is the same thing as the pin in a register that is labeled zero. What, do you, what does it do? It resets. it resets, exactly. So when clear is a one in this case, 
it will zero out the content of this ROM module. Okay, it just turns everything into a zero. Okay, so now we have this pin here, which is also one of the pins of a register. Which pin is that? The clock pin, very good, good job. So the clock pin serves exactly the same purpose. If this particular RAM module is going to update its content, it's going to update in a particular clock edge. And I think the default or the only option is a rising edge. Are we doing okay so far with this discussion? Okay. So the only thing left is this pin here called out, which is not in the register. The reason why this is not in the register is because with the register, there's the D port that you use to specify new content, and there's the Q port that you use to output the current content of the register. But with the RAM, it is the same D port. It's both is used to output as well as input. So this particular thing is basically the direction control. The, uh, throughout this documentation, it is inconsistent. In the text, it is referred to as the LD pin, low pin, but in the pictures, it's referred to as the out pin. But the polarity will still be the same, okay? The best way to remember this particular pin, myself, for myself, is R slash W. Mm -hmm. It's a read by pin. But it's not just be, the slash actually has a special meaning. It's not really only here to separate the right, the read from the right. <coughs> it is also, it's also saying that from the perspective of reading, it is asserted when it is a one. But from the perspective of writing, it is asserted when it is a low. It is active low. Which means, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so what that means is when the, when the out or LD or the read write pin is a one, you are specifying a read operation from the perspective of the outside entity, which also means the data port is driving the bus with the content of a particular memory location. When read write or out or load is a zero, you're specifying a write operation, which means the D port serves as an input to the RAM module itself. Something else has to drive that port so that you can store a particular content to a location in the RAM. Is that okay? Conceptually, is that okay? Does everybody understand? Okay. So what we'll do next is we'll have not we'll we'll bring up Logic Sim and we'll play with a particular RAM module. So here's a logic sim. We'll bring in a memory RAM module put it right here at the center. So the first thing you notice is you can actually change the content of this RAM, but only if you go to um, edit content. So now you can change the content. The second thing is there are attributes associated with a RAM module. As far as this data interface is concerned, we're always going to use the first one in this class. And then as far as the other ones are concerned, eight, which is a, a byte, one single location has eight bits, is good because it is a byte. And then the other one is eight bit because we uh, want 256 locations in this case. But you can change those if you want to. All right, so to experiment, experiment with this, we're gonna connect an input pin <coughs> that's eight bit wide to the address pin. We'll connect some other input pins to the other ones. Okay, one to connect to cell to select, one output pin to connect to the D. And this will change later. Later, so we're gonna have some changes to this diagram later on. We'll also pick out a clock pin from wiring to connect to the clock itself, and then two more input pins, one to connect to load. And I'm going to use a button to connect to, uh, to clear because that's kind of momentary. We only need it once in a long while. So we have a button connected to the clear here. There we go. So now we can start to play with it. So the first thing we do is, yep, go ahead. Robo, when you brought up the, when you double clicked on the uh, RAM to bring up the thing to edit the contents, uh -huh. when you hit save there, that's the file you want us to save at name.bomb in our project, right? That's a file. You can change the extension to anything you want. Oh, but then, I mean, that's the file, right? Yeah, the, the it's the file that you write to. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that will become useful later on. But right now, it's not as useful. So right now, you know, I can specify and say, 
Okay, so this whole thing, you know, I can do something over here. And nothing is doing anything. In other words, the output being all X's here means it is not driven. In other words, as far as the output pin is concerned, it cannot tell whether each bit should be a zero or one because the entire thing is left quote unquote floating. Nobody is specifying it. If no one's specifying, there's no such thing as a default because you're looking at a single wire, okay? Is that single wire, you know, by default having a voltage of zero or, a, you know, or some non-zero voltage in the computer? We don't know, it's just floating. It is an antenna, okay? Depending on whether you're using a microwave next to it or not, you know, it can be flipping between zeros and ones, it can be ones all the time, it can be zeros all the time. We don't know, okay? So the one thing you want to do first is to say, okay, how do we drive these pins? So look at each one individually. The clear pin is not going to be very useful because all it, all it does is to zero everything in the content of the RAM. Now if you really just want to play with that, you can just, uh, using this tool here, you can you know, go to one particular location and just change that location. Okay, so just to illustrate how reset works, I'm changing two locations so, they, so that they are non-zero. I press this pin and they all turn back into zero. Okay, it's just reset. That's all it does. Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So let's say we want to change one of these to a particular content. We'll call it mm, A5. A5 is 1010 zero, one, zero for the A, 0101 zero, one, zero, one for the 5. So we know exactly what bit pattern should be the output. And I want the output to look like that. I want the output to be 1010101. One, zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. What else should I do at this point? Hmm? I want to turn on the RAM. I want to select the RAM, right? Go ahead. It doesn't need a clock. Since we, this is a read operation, the clock is not used. So in this case, we want to turn on the RAM, which means cell select has to be a one. Okay. All right. So what else do we need to do? The low pin needs to be a one because it is a read write operation. It's a read write pin, which means one means we are reading. Very good. But it's reading the wrong location. It's reading from this location, which is six A. How do we change that? Change the address. Change the address to. Do you guys remember where the other one is? <laughs> I cannot. Okay, so it is right here. This entire row is 0, 0. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A. So this is location 0, A, which means we have to turn this. There we go. So now we got the content of location 0, A. The value of that location is A5, and that is now driving the data point. So are we okay so far with how to read <coughs> the location in RAM? Okay. How do we write to RAM then? I want to change location, let's say, 0D to something other than 0. How do we do that? Well, first of all, we know this part can no longer be an output pin. So we'll say, okay, if it's not an output pin, it's got to be an input pin, right? And it has to be a bit wide to fit the size or the width of the data bus. Okay, so we switch that. And then we say, okay, bing, we have a problem. Right there, we have a problem. Why do we have a problem here? A red line means you know, either it cannot be determined or there's a problem. When you click it, it will tell you, or actually when you look at the output pin, it tells you there's a problem too. That E has to do with, we have a bus byte. It, it's literally called a bus byte because it is, this is called a data bus. A bus is basically a you know, term used in industry to describe a collection of traces, a collection of signals, a collection of wires that collectively per that perform a single function. So these eight wires okay, that are bundled up you know, together is serving the purpose of you know, data. And that's why it's called a data bus. A fight is basically when one component wants a wire to have a high voltage and the other component wants the same wire to have a low voltage, then we have a fight. Okay, because you know, one is pushing it one way, the other one is pulling it the other way, 
and whoever is stronger wins. So this time, you know, who are the who are our who are our contestants? The RAM module is one of the con contestants because the RAM module says, I want to output one zero one zero zero one zero one, but the input pin is the other one. The input pin represents an interface from somebody else. Now, who is that somebody else? We don't know because we are just saying, okay, somebody else can also specify the content. So that other entity, the outside entity, which is usually connected to the processor, is specifying, hey, I want these wires to be zero one zero 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 zero. So that's why you, when you look at the E's, those are the ones that have a contention. The processor wants to drive this pin or the bit seven to a one, but the input pin wants to drive it to a zero. So now we have a bus fight. All right. Mm. So for now, we'll use a very simple um, way to solve this problem. We get rid of this little section of the wire. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Only for now, okay? Because you cannot do this inside the processor. You cannot say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll physically erase a trace <laughs> when we have a write operation, but reconnect this trace when we have a read operation. Can't do that, right? But that's okay. We'll, we'll figure out a way to handle this. All right, so we want the new location to have a content of, what do you guys want? FE. FE? Okay, FE is 11111110, that's FE. <coughs> and obviously we still have a bus fight here because the RAM module, not only is it selected, it is also performing a quote unquote read operation, which means the content is being output to the bus. Okay, maybe the first thing we need to do is to say, hey, okay, we're not talking to you. If, you, if, if the RAM is not selected, it, does, it stops driving the data port, okay? Because that's the whole idea, is you can have a whole bunch of RAM modules <coughs> sharing the same data bus, but only one, up to one of them, will drive the data bus. But during this time, we have to do some manipulation here. So we are gonna change the, the address to the location that we want. The location that we want is 0D, so zero, 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 zero is one hexadecimal zero. D is one, one, zero, one. Okay, so now we've got the right location. We also want to turn this particular bit off because remember this load bit is R slash W, which means if you want to write operation to the RAM module, you want to assert it with a zero. It's, it's active low as far as the write signal is concerned, it is active low. Now that we got all of those specified, we can tell the RAM module and go like, wake up, we're talking to you. So at this point, you can see the highlighted portion of RAM is already at location 0D, which means the RAM is awake, it is interpreting the address pins, and it is now selecting the location. And at this point, it says, okay, I'm preparing for a write operation. But nothing is done because it is just like a register, it is edge sensitive. Sure. And it's rising edge sensitive. So the clock pin is currently at a stable state which is low, and that's why nothing happens. The moment I transition the clock pin from low to high, it updates the content. And that completes a write cycle for the memory. Are we doing okay so far with this picture? Yep. Can you read Yes, you can read when the Whatever read operations are are asynchronous, which means you know you can read any time you want. But write operations are synchronous. It only occurs when you have a rising edge at the clock. Okay, any other questions? We have a re read cycle. We have a write cycle. And that's pretty much the only two things that you you're supposed to do with RAM. Yep. So if you were to reset it now, would it go back to? Yes, it will all go back to zero if I were to reset it here. Okay, but we have one problem to solve, okay? Because in the circuit, you cannot just say, oh, sometimes we make this connection, other times we make the other connection. Okay, so let's go ahead and see how we can solve that particular problem. So the problem has to do with when we are doing a read operation, this wire sometimes needs to connect, other times it needs to disconnect. Okay? So we're going to take out this wire and go like, okay, we'll replace it with something that can disconnect. 
and one of the components can do that under gates it is called a controlled buffer the control buffer looks exactly just like that it is um, in circuit design a triangle means a amplifier okay you have an input and then the output is the same as the input except it has more you know capability to drive current it's a repeater basically is that okay so just look at this as a repeater yep um, just a question on that why is the knock symbol a triangle then the the knot symbol is also a triangle except it is um it has a bubble Yep. So the bubble itself is representing negation, not the triangle. Gotcha. The triangle is a repeater, you know, type of deal. It's a is an amplifier. But the bubble after that is the negation. Gotcha. So in this case we actually need a negated um, buffer, negated controlled buffer, where the input and the output are related in a negated you know, fashion. But this third line here is the clutch. Okay, you can, if this is a 1, then the output is the negation of the input. If that pin, the pin that is highlighted right now, is a 0, then the output is not driven. The output is simply going like, meh, I'm not connected to anything, despite what the input is. Okay. So we'll, we'll need a component like this. Actually, I take it back. We don't need a negated one. We just need a non-negated one. And we'll make it phase south. So that the output is pointing down, and the control line is going to be left-handed. Okay, we'll put it here, and change the number of bits to eight. Okay, so they have the same same width, and obviously this is still not working because I'm not specifying uh, the the enable, which is by default on. In other words, I I need to connect this thing to something. Okay, to the rewrite, okay, that's not a bad idea. So let's go ahead and make that connection and see if it solves the problem. Okay, so we have this hooked up to the read write line, which is also known as the, the load line. Okay. So right now it seems to be working, but remember this is a write operation. A write operation means this D port is not driving. <coughs> Okay, if that line is not driving, we, we don't have a bus fight. So let's go back and specify a read operation at this point. And we're not going to read the same location because if you're reading the same location, then the two things that are trying to drive the same lines, they both want to drive the same wire high. They, all, they both want to drive the same wire low, so you don't have a fight. So we want it to go to location, some other location that has a zero. So we're, we're, we're changing the address pin to C. Okay, which has a content of zero, 0, So once I turn the load pin or the read write pin to a high, which specifies a read operation, now we have a fight. Okay, so the clutch is not working. Well, it's not not working, it is just not controlled correctly. In other words, we just need to negate it. We need to negate the control signal going to the control buffer. Because when LD is a one, we want to disconnect the input pin. So that can be done with just a negation pin, a negation gate, and we'll put the negation gate right here. And now we don't have a bus fight. Because when the when the D port is driving, we disconnect the input pin. On the other hand, when the D port is not driving, then we reconnect the output pin to the output pin. We connect, reconnect the input pin to the output pin. There we go. So are we doing okay so far with this picture? Okay, cool. So now the, big, the next question is, how do these things fit into the big picture of a processor? Okay. And this is something that you can do as well, you know, and I, Suggest that you give it a try a few times at least, uh, just so that you know how to how to do it. So what we're doing is we're going to I'm going to put a hyperlink to the beginning of this page here. So I'm going to put a hyperlink over here. It connects to my Google Drive. There's a shared folder 
for this class and also the uh, Tuesday Thursday class We want to go to CISP 310 shared and when you go to processor I'm gonna uh, link this one first okay so we'll go ahead and share this entire thing and where's my share there we go copy link go back to here Nope, I don't want to add a module. I want to add a component to this module. So I'm adding it to quote unquote the syllabus module, which is topic independent. Paste it here. And we'll just call this, you know, shared folder. There we go. So now you have access to the same thing. Okay. So back to the share folder, you, you're more than welcome to explore stuff if you want to. But right now what we are talking about is inside the processor folder. In the processor folder, I have got a few leftover stuff here. <clears throat> but the files that you need to download at this point, one is RegBank, register bank. One is processor WDPC2. Okay, you know, we'll, there's, a, there's a reason why it has that name. And also ALU is the last one. So I think ALU is right here. So these are the three files that you should download, you know, in order to see how the processor is designed. So I'm gonna download these three files. You can I, I'm showing you exactly what you should see when you do this. So you just say download. So Google Drive is gonna zip the drive first, zip the files into one single file, and then you download a single zip file, and then you decompress it. So I'm gonna save this file to the temp folder, okay. And switch to a command line here. Go to the temp folder. The file is right here, drive-download-da-da-da. So we say unzip. In Windows, you just double click in and it will unzip the file. So now we got three files. So the next thing we need to do is to go to Logisim, say open, and then go to the folder where those files are located. And you can open each individual one if you want to. In fact, that's exactly what we'll do. Well, okay. We'll open the processor first. So this will show you what happens when you open the file. The first thing you will see is, hey, we're missing the alu.circ file. In other words, one it's, it's doing a pound include, so to speak, okay? So processor uh, WPC2 is doing a pound include of some other files. But since there are no paths already set up and say, hey, if you need to find something, go to here, it doesn't know, it doesn't understand where to find it. So it just reports back and go like, it's missing. But it also says, please select a file from the following dialog, which means it gives you a chance to go to whatever folder this thing is located, which is usually in the same folder, and say select. And the same thing applies to register bank, same thing, you just go here, you locate register bank in the same folder, click select, now we have the processor. That's the same reaction that I got from the Tuesday Thursday class. <laughs> it's only complicated because we are zoomed in, see if you zoom out, it's not that complicated, it's pretty simple. I mean, all right, so what it does, you know, what we have here is a very simple processor that works in, when simulated in Logisim. Okay, it's a risk processor. It can do very simple stuff, but we can do string compare, we can do string length, we can do some, we, we can even do recursion with this. Okay, but limited kind of recursion because the whole thing only has 256 bytes of RAM. And that's where you store your stack, your variables, and your program. Remember, this is a von Neumann architecture where the instructions are stored exactly where you store your data to be processed. Okay? But it's general purpose enough to do what we need to do in this class for illustration. There are two things here that are not 
the, lo the lowest level type of device. I'll point out which those things are. This is the register bank, and over here we have the ALU. So those things individually expands to something else. So you can say view register bank, it looks like this. Relatively simple. And if you go to the other one, it is a little bit more complex. The ALU is a little bit more complex, it looks like this. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the ALU first, okay? So what you can do is you can open the ALU by itself. All right, so this new window here has the ALU opened all by itself, and we'll, we'll try to figure out what it's gonna do. At the core of the ALU are circuitry that can actually do computation, and you did some of those early in the semester. You did the adder, you also did the subtractor. In the exam, you did a unified adder set slash subtractor, okay? So what we have here is an adder right here. Okay, so we'll click the adder. So this is an adder, this is a subtractor, but it can also do some other operations. This is a right shift operation. This is bitwise not, this is bitwise and, and this is bitwise or. So this particular processor only has six basic calculation operations that it can perform. Is that okay? So the next question is, okay, we have six computations that can occur. What is, what are they processing? What are we adding? What are we subtracting? Okay, so you look at each one. You look at the adder first. Okay, let's not worry about carry in and carry out. Okay, so we're not concerned about those at this point. So when you look at the adder, you ask, okay, what two numbers are they adding? You track down the wires, okay? So when you track down the wires, it really helps if you use this tool instead. So you can click on the wire. So you say, oh, the first input is this thick wire here. The second input is this thick wire here. Um, they don't go all the way to the input pins, but where do they go? They go to a D mux, which is a D multiplexer. What does, what does a D multiplexer do? It's a switch. It's got one input and multiple possible outputs. That's all it is. So <coughs> this is the output side, the, the thick wire, the, the wire that is selected now is the output side of a DMUX. This is the input side of the DMUX. This is the control signal. This is the signal that says, oh, we need to switch to the first output, the second output, the third output, and so on. And you can see that the same wire goes everywhere in this particular design. It goes to the first DMUX, the second DMUX. It also goes to the MUX as the output. Okay, in other words, these three switches, they all switch at the same time to the same position. Are we doing okay so far? How many bits is at the gray dot? Since we have eight possible outputs, it's got three wires because you need three bits to specify one. From zero to seven, you need three wires to specify those values. Okay, so that means and when I click on the wire, it shows me the actual content of that wire. So right now, without me actually clicking anything, it has a default value of 0, 0, 0. So that is the reason why this, out, this input is connected to this input here. Um, how do we know that? Well, let's, let's actually do some calculations. You can see this output here are all x's. Why do you think they're all x's? What is, how do you use a mux? It's not enabled, okay? If the enable is off. The enable is this particular wire here, and it is currently off, which means, okay, let's turn it on first. And that wire is ALU enable, this wire. Okay, let me click it first. So this, this wire connects to all three of these <coughs> switches to enable the whole thing. In other words, if I don't need the ALU to do something, I'm going to turn it off to save some power, to save some energy. So the first thing you need to do to utilize the ALU is to say, okay, ALU, I need you to do something. So now that turns on everything, and you can see the output is being driven to zero because the default operation, which is OPSEL, operation select or operator select, is zero, zero, zero. So that means all the switches 
the first, the two D boxes on the left and the one single box on the right, they're all switching to the first position or position zero. Which also means whatever input I have here is going to this particular output. Whatever input I have here oops, is connected to the second input of the adder. This output of the adder is connected to the first input of the mux, and that is currently connecting, it's currently connecting this <coughs> to the actual output pin. Okay? Well, let's do some addition here. So we'll add th f 7 and 8. 7 plus 8 is 15. Okay, that works. Is, is that okay? And then suddenly I would say, okay, addition is boring. We want to do a subtraction. How do we make the ALU perform a subtraction instead? Change, change OPSEL, OPSLEC, and how should we change it? Huh? Zero, zero, 001, very good. So when we switch this to zero, zero, 001, it becomes a subtraction. 7 minus 8 is negative 1. Okay, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 represents negative 1 as a signed value. Are we doing okay so far with the basic operation of the ALU, the arithmetic and logic unit? It's okay. So in this really kind of <coughs> simplistic processor, there's only one single ALU. How many ALUs is in one core of the i7 processor line? Now the i7 has got four, six, is that up to eight now? The latest and greatest? Is it eight? Eight what? Eight cores inside it, the i7, the it latest. depends on which i7. Yeah, but the maximum, the, the top, uh, top dog. Uh, the one they're coming out with, I think, may have 10 cores. Okay. Number of cores in I7. So it's up to 8. Okay. So how many ALUs do you think it has per core? <coughs> we'll just count integer you know, ALUs. Because it's got floating point ALUs and also integer ALUs. Is it 2? I think it's more than two. Yeah. So we change the question now. We say, you know, number of ALUs in a core. And we'll say I7. Hmm? Oh, this is great. I'm a... Hello, I'm a student, and this semester I'm learning computer architecture. <laughs> okay, we know about the register part, but how many ALUs does it have? Is that what the student is asking? Oh, this, this only, the student is only ask, asking about registers. Okay, I trust Quora a little bit more. Eight or sixteen ALUs per core, not counting the scalar ALU. So it has a lot. Okay. So that's that means you know, the processor that we are looking at in Logisim is way, 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 way simplified. Okay. Now, if you're designing a processor like the i7 processor. It has got many ALUs, but it has only for each from each core's perspective, it really only has one stream of instructions coming in. What is the point? Okay. Because each instruction can only specify one thing to do. One instruction can say, "I want addition between these two registers, and that register stores the output." Yep. So not the first pass. But that's between cores. That that is not intra-core issue. It's an inter-core issue. Does that make any sense? So it's not that. Okay. Each core is only handling one thread at a time, which means instructions are only coming in in a very sequential way. First, do this. Next, do this. Next, do this. Next, do this. 
and each instruction supposedly can only specify one single operation. So why do you need multiple ALUs when that is the case? Yep. Well, certain operations like multiplication and division can take a little bit longer than one single clock. Addition and subtraction, I can imagine they can only take one clock. Okay. So what happens is the i7 processor as well as you know, the, the equivalent processor of the AMD and other advanced processors, they do hardware real-time scheduling. Okay? They look at the incoming stream of instructions to execute, and then they, it will order the execution of those instructions so that it will optimize the use of the ALUs. They will see that, oh, there's a multiplication, but it doesn't depend on anything from the addition or the subtraction, which are the early instructions. So it will actually do the scheduling and say, okay, let's do the multiplication, let's start it first. <laughs> Okay, and then we'll do the adding and the subtracting at the same time. So you'll figure out the interdependency of these calculations and then you'll schedule the use of the ALUs you know, accordingly. And this is all done by hardware, it's not even done by software. Is that okay? So you will think, oh, if this is all done by hardware, then software people can just rest easy and they have nothing to deal with, right? That is not true. Because if you specify your instruction stream where then you, you have some really constraint on ordering, then the hardware will just go like, I can't do a single thing here, okay? Because the incoming instruction stream specifically needs to, be, needs to have the addition done, and then the result of the addition is used in the multiplication. So it cannot change the ordering of, those, of the utilization of the ALUs. So what do you think software people have to do now? If you're if you're writing a compiler, okay, and Intel is paying you big, paying you big bucks and say, if you can write a compiler to make our benchmark look really good, you get all this chunk of money, okay. What are you gonna do? You will write the compiler to emit instructions where the interdependencies is the least. In other words, you actually need to understand. How many ALUs are inside the processor? You need to understand, you know, okay, this is the C code. These are the things to be done. How can I maximize the number of ALUs to be utilized all the time? So the, perp so the people who are writing compilers, especially the optimization backend of a processor, uh, of a compiler, needs to study these individual processors and understand how many ALUs are, are available how, what kind of parallelism is supported in hardware by these processors, and then do optimizations accordingly. Is that making any sense? So even the hardware can do some scheduling itself, it still relies on software to crank out the instructions so they can maximize the utilization of all of these ALUs so that you can, you can have the best throughput and you can execute the most instructions in the shortest amount of time. Is that making any sense? Is that okay? <clears throat> this is also why there's a difference between, okay, when you, when you refer to the 64-bit instructions, what is it called? What, it, what is it called? It's called AMD 64, not Intel 64. Why is that the case? Even though the, it's the Intel processor, it's the i7 processor, <coughs> but it's running what we call the AMD 64 instruction set. Why is that the case? That seems like an oxymoron. Yep. Because AMD figured out how to get 64 backwards compatibility before Intel did. Well, it, there's no compatibility to, to, be, to, to speak of, but it has to do with the instruction set itself not being um, easily optimized. Mm -hmm. So Intel first came up with the Itanium, which is their first 64-bit architecture with the 64-bit instructions, but the instruction was not designed to be optimized easily by compilers. Okay, okay? and then AMD, you know, were the second, but their instruction set was easier. Was it makes more sense to the compiler people? So, and that's why you know uh, Intel later on adopted the same instruction set because the AMD version makes more sense. So to understand that particular topic, I'm not going to go too deep into it. 
titanium versus AMD 64. And if you and what you want to talk when what you want to concentrate on is the instructions. So you can look you can read up some of these uh, discussions and then you will start to understand why there's that, that big whole confusion of you know this is an Intel processor but it's using AMD instruction set what's going on here the only reason why I know about this one is because one of my uh, roommates back in college back in graduate school he uh, he's a compiler backend expert you know doing optimization in the back end and he's the one who first you know got into the titanium versus the AMD 64 instruction set and he said, you know, the AMD instruction set is just so much easier to optimize compared to the Intel instruction set. So there's that. So it's kind of cool, interesting stuff. Is yep. it um, so you cannot a patent a in, an instruction set. No. Yep. But just because it is called AMD 64, I'm pretty sure that's a pretty hard hard pill for Intel to swallow. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. You can own the copyright on an instruction set, though, right? You can copyright. I don't know. I don't know whether that is the case or not. I don't think. I don't think you can copyright instruction sets. Hmm. All right. So getting back to our design here. So with this one, you, you can also see their flags too. Okay. So remember, um, with subtraction, we got the borrow flag. This is the borrow flag. But the output of the processor is unifying all the flags into one. So what it does is it has one C out here, which is the same C out here. That is going through a MUX, and do you guess what is controlling this MUX? Op select, okay? The same operation select. So now it is taking the borrow flag of the subtractor and use it as the carry flag, as the output, as flags out. If I select an addition, it, it, it will use the carry flag of the adder to be the output. But at this point, it's going to use the borrow flag. What flags? What other flags are in the processor? There's a Z flag here. Okay, so this is the best way to look at the Z flag. It really is literally the nor of all the output bits. The Z flag is supposed to be a one, given only if the result of a calculation is a zero. Okay which also means if at least one bit of the output is a one, I want the, the, the Z flag to be a zero. Because the output is not zero, okay? So this is literally what it does, okay? It really is just taking every single bit of the output of, of the entire ALU and say, are we looking at zero? If we are looking at zero, then Z out is a one. If it is not zero, then Z out is a, is a zero. That's why it's a, it's a nor, because it's a or with a negation at the output. So why is that useful to know? Because it can let you know whether two things are the same or not after a subtraction. Okay. So that's the really only use of the Z flag is to see whether you know the two things that you're comparing are the same or not. Gotcha. Because the other way to tell whether they're the same or not <coughs> is to use two comparisons, which is which costs you more time. But this is a really easy circuit to build, so why, might as well just do it this way. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we also have the overflow flag. So with the overflow flag, can anyone remember how it is defined with a subtraction? <laughs> it means the sign of the result makes no sense, right? So let's take a look at this ALU and figure out how it's done. Okay, so let me zoom in to this part here. Okay, this is S1, and can you tell how S1 relates to the input of the ALU? It's going through a splitter, okay, believe it or not, this is a splitter, it just doesn't look like it, but it is a splitter. It's only taking bit 7, which is the most significant bit. Sorry? Which is the sign bit, exactly. So it's taking the sign bit of the input of E1, and we call it S1, as a tunnel. And then we take bit seven of the second input and call it S2. It's the same deal here. Is that okay? 
And then over here, we take the sign bit of the output and call S out. Sign of the output. So now we have the sign of the minnow end, the sign of the subtrahend, and then the sign of the difference. Do you guys do remember the equation to compute the overflow flag, or at least the rationale of that equation? Okay. So when you scroll down a little bit, you will see that equation. This part here, not the top one, but this part here. Okay, let me you just click a Y here. This means the output of this subtraction, the sign of the output makes sense, and that's why the overflow flag is a zero. All it does is to say S1, which is the sign of the middle end, S2, which is the sign of the supper hand, and S out, which is the sign of the difference. It is saying, okay, if the if you start off with a it's negative, so if you start off with a non-negative value, you subtract a negative value, and you end up with a non-negative value, then everything is good. If you, you, start, you end up with a negative value, then the result is not good. Now what do I about this for addition, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So we have one circuitry for addition, one circuitry for subtraction. Which one should we use as the actual as the actual <coughs> overflow? We use a box to decide. So the box is here to say, if we're adding, pick up the first one. If we're subtracting, pick up the second one. What if it's bit shifting where overflow makes no sense? Then we have a pass through. Okay. So O in is overflow in, which is coming back in from the from the flight register. So we just say, oh, we'll, we'll keep it the same. We're not changing <coughs> overflow because overflow does not apply to shifting or ending or oring and stuff like that. Is that okay? So that's our ALU. So you can study the rest of it, but it's really just using components that we have already talked about. So by explaining how to subtract and how to add, you know, we have already touched on all of the components already. What about the other one? What about the register bank? So let's take a look at the register bank by itself. So you can open, once again, you can open the component itself. That, that allows you to play with it. Okay, this is the register bank. And we'll make it a little bit bigger. And the register bank doesn't do a whole lot. In some way, it is much simpler than the ALU. Because you can see that there's a, it's very uniform. Okay, there's no you know, special things in one way or another. But we do have a decoder in this case. Register in, reg in, this particular pin, is used to update a single register. Reg out, there are two of those. They are used to output um, the content of registers. So the purpose of the register bank is to work closely with the ALU. The reg in is used to store the result after calculation. The two reg outs are used to supply values to the ALU. And that's why we have two reg outs and only one <coughs> reg in. Is that okay so far? What are the reg outs and reg ins? Um, so we have reg out zero, reg out one as register output. And then we have reg in over here as register input. Okay. So if we if you want to update one of these four registers, okay, let's say you want to update this particular register, what do you think you have to do? Just looking at the schematic here. If I want to update this guy to I don't know, six E, what should I do? Okay, so we have to specify six E as reg in first, right? So let's specify reg six uh, E. This is 6, and an E is that, okay? Hey, nothing is happening. What is going on here? Well, none of the, these registers are enabled. Remember, a register needs to be enabled first, and then the clock needs to have a rising edge transition in order for the register to change. So right now, they're not even enabled. Okay, tell, tell me how I should enable uh, the third register from the top. We have to turn on the enable. Okay, so let's click on this enable here and see where it connects. It connects to the third output of the decoder. So how do I make the third line, the third output of the decoder turn on? To a one zero. Okay, very good. So reg in cell, register input select needs to be a one zero. 
but still nothing is happening. We have to do the enable. Okay, so we have to click this to enable it. Aha, very good. Ah, but it's still not updated. What's going on? The clock line, very good. You can see how the clock line is connected to everything, right? So we now have a clock and only that single register is updated. None of the other registers is affected. Because guess what? None of them is actually is even enabled. Yep. This diagram can only do one at a time, right? Mm -hmm. It can only do one register at a time. You can only update one register at a time, correct? That is by design. Okay. <coughs> All right. Cool. Yep. Why are there two outputs? For the because the ALU requires two inputs for most operations. So that's why you need to have two outputs. But you can have the same register appearing as both outputs. That's OK. So it just copies that like, to both? Yep. Same yeah, because, the, because each one has its own select line. So all you have to do is to select from the same register. Yep. All right, so let's call this the end of the input or the update your operation. And then the next thing we want to do is to output the registers. I want the first register to be the second <coughs> output, and I want the third register to be the first output. How should I do that? Okay, so one zero here, and you can see it updates right away. And the bottom one is already zero zero, so I got it done already. So this is how you utilize a register bank is from the outside perspective, it has this one port to update any one of the four registers. And there are two outputs to the entire register bank. Each output can connect to any one of the four registers in the inside. Is that okay? And then the reset line is shared with everything. If I click the reset line, it resets all the registers at the same time. The clock line is also shared with everything. So the register bank is pretty easy to understand. You know, you just have the, these individual select, select, and select, so that you, each port has its own selection. Okay, I'm, go I'm gonna close this. Going back to the processor itself. Okay, so we'll reopen the processor. Unless I have that one already still here. Nope, okay, so we'll, we'll just reopen it. There we go. So we reopen the processor. Oh, it's still, it's still wants to know. Once you save it, it, it will remember where to find the other two files. But I didn't save it. There we go. So here's the processor. And you can see if you zoom in, even though it looks really messy and ugly and all kinds of stuff like that, every single component we know already. Okay, These are tunnels. And we got the register bank, we got the mugs, the mugs, and we have lots and lots of tunnels. This is a AND gate. Um, we got registers, adder, register again. So all the components we have talked about already. What's the that, uh, DC mux below the? This one? No. Uh, the this one? Yeah. No. This guy? No, below the PC mux. Yeah, uh, this is a tunnel. Yeah, you're just controlling you know, north, east, south, oh, west okay. as the connection point. But it really is just a tunnel. <clears throat> if I don't use tunnels, you can see all the wires will be flying around, you know, in <coughs> really me in a messy way, and that's why I use tunnels. But one thing I do want to point out is the clock. Okay, here's the clock. Where is the clock connecting to? The clock is connected to the registers, connected to this particular register, this register, this register, connected to RAM. In other words, everything that is clocked share the same clock. Where's the reset line going to? The reset line that has this label here has this you know, tunnel. Everything that can be reset, everything in the register bank, each individual register, as well as RAM, they all connect to the same reset line. So this is kind of interesting because we only got one clock and one reset for the entire processor. It's not just the processor. 
because RAM is not technically a part of the processor. RAM is technically a part of the computer itself, where the processor is just a component of a, of a computer. All right, so any questions about this? So now the biggest question is, okay, so we know from, the, from writing C programs, okay, you know that sometimes you need to uh, do calculations. But every single calculation can only be done inside the, inside the ALU. So the question now is, if, you're, if the numbers are stored in RAM, how do you get those numbers into the registers so that you can use those registers to feed the ALU? So you can do the computation. Whatever the result is, you have to store it back into a register and then store that register back into RAM. So how do we get all of these done, these things done? What do you think? How, how, do you, how do you work on this? If I were to, yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just saying very carefully. Carefully, okay. <laughs> carefully, it would be good. <laughs> so what we do is we look at the picture. So let's say we want to perform this operation. So let's say, <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna write it down here. So let's say we want to store the content of memory location 0x, I don't know, 6e, to the registers are labeled A, B, C, D, so C would be the, would be 2 or 1, 0, okay? So if I want to do this, store the content of memory location 6e to register C, what would, what is involved in this whole process? Okay, so obviously the RAM is involved here. Okay, so you say, okay, so we need the address bus, okay, we need the RAM, the address bus of RAM to be 6e. <coughs> we need to specify this is a read operation, right? So we also need the RAM select to be a one to, to make the RAM pay attention. We also need to specify uh, the read write signal, which is known as LD, to read operation, which, which is also a one. The reset line is usually low, okay, so, you know, but we'll specify that anyway. Um, the clock line doesn't really matter at this point, so I'm not going to specify that, okay. So all of these things will make the RAM drive the D port with the data, yep? Wouldn't the RAM LD have to be, if we're reading, are we reading the address location 6E? We're reading the location 6E, grab whatever, whatever it has, and then store that into register C, okay? But just this part leaves a lot of questions unanswered because who can drive the address bus of the RAM? Okay, let's go here. We'll click the address bus here. It doesn't go very far, does it? It doesn't go back to the registers because it goes only back to a MUX. So now you have two choices. You can say, oh, so this wire can drive the address bus, this Y can drive the address bus as well. In other words, we have this register here called PC, or program counter, that can drive the address bus to specify which location do we want to access. But alternatively, we can also use the other alternative here, which goes to, this MUX goes to a DMUX, and this DMUX goes to the register bank. So we can also specify a register in the register bank to drive the address bus. Those are the only two ways to drive the address bus. Is that okay? When the data is presented, okay, let's say we choose one of these two and it so happens to have 6E driving the address bus. Then the data bus will have the content at that location. How do we store this into register C? Okay, so you look at how they're connected. Okay, it connects to this instruction register. That's not register C, so forget about that. It connects to this DMUX here, but a DMUX is only useful as an output. If you want a bus fight, yeah, this is one way to have a bus fight, but that's not what we want. We want to store whatever is presented on the data bus to a register. But you also see that it goes here as well as here. This one is the one that we want because this connects to a MUX, which in return connects to the input, re input register in of our register bank. So that's what we need. 
But to specify register 2 or register C to be updated, we also need this thing. Okay, I can't highlight it. Ah, I cannot highlight the wire. Okay, let me try to click something else first. No, no, it should be. I should be. I should be able to select the wire like that. But it's not letting me select the wire. Okay, all right, fine. We can select it. We can select the tunnel instead. Okay, there we go. So we need whatever is connecting to this tunnel to specify one zero as a bit parallel. Is that okay? Uh, who controls the the load, the select of the RAM? There's RAM cell here. There's RAM load. And where are those things all connecting to? So if I highlight that, you will see where they're connected to. Click that. There we go. See how that thick wire is connected here? There's a, there's a merger. And it all connects to this ROM here. Okay. So this ROM here, okay, let me, let me click on the ROM itself so that we know which one we are talking about. This ROM here is very important because it seems like, you know, this ROM, you can also see that it has a, it's pretty wide because each row is one memory location. And you can tell that each memory location has um, one, two, three, four, five, six, almost, you know, seven hexadecimal digits. 7 times 4 is 28. 28 plus 1, it actually has only one more than that. This thing has 29 <coughs> bits. And each bit is controlled to one of these tunnels to control one particular aspect of the processor. And what does it connect to, this law? On the address side, where does it connect to? We know the output is going to orchestrate the, all the boxes and all the other things, you know. But what about the other side? What, what about the address side here? What is connected? What does it look like to you? And does, it, does it ring a bell as far as your homework assignment is concerned? Okay, it does, right? It connects to an auto increment mechanism. Now it's a little bit more complicated than the one that you have, but nonetheless about the same kind of mechanism. It auto increments. Zero goes to one, one goes to two, two goes to three. It's a, it's, a, it's a music box mechanism. So now we have a music box mechanism playing some kind of complex tune because we have 29 individual things, in individual times that can be plugged, <coughs> right? Each one connects to some control signal as far as the rest of the components are concerned. They all connect to decoders, demultiplexers, multiplexers, the select of the RAM, blah, 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 blah. They are all control signals. So that means in order to do and perform a single operation, you need to sequentially specify, okay, this switch connects here, that switch connects over there, you turn on, you pay attention, and so on and so forth. That's how the inside of a processor works. And that's why you have your music box homework assignment. Because your homework assignment is only <coughs> doing this part here. It's really just the metronome of a, of a conductor. You're providing the tick, 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 and moving the, the notes along you know, in, in a piece of music. And then what this part what this component part here, what this entire part is doing, that's the controller of the entire railroad system. Remember the island of Sodor, Thomas Train, okay, and Sir Topham Hatt. Sir Topham Hatt is in his office. This is Sir Topham Hatt playing a tune. And then every single time you know, he do something, the rest of the island is changing the configuration accordingly. It is changing the track. This track now connects over there. This depot is now active. It is fueling this particular engine. That particular track is now connected to the warehouse and so on and so forth. So by coordinating all of these things in a meaningful way, 
we execute instructions. We can grab something from memory, store it into a register. We can perform calculations, okay? You know, use this register to specify one input of the ALU, use that register to specify the input of the, the other input of the ALU, use this register here to store the result of the calculation, okay? And then the next instruction can then say, oh, you know, now that we got the content, we got the result of the previous calculation, let's store that to a location in RAM. But which location do we, do we want to store that to? What about the location pointed to by that other register down here? So it's, it's going to specify these things in very, very small steps, one thing at a time, okay? And you can look at this thing and go like, Okay, I can see how this can do some really simplistic calculations, but I write C programs that are far more complex than this thing can, can deal with. Well, I beg to differ. <laughs> this thing, the only limitation of this thing is it only got 256 locations. That limits how complex of a program you can write. But in terms of idea, principle, concepts, and whatnot, Anything you can write in C, I can implement it here. I can compile that code manually and make it run on this processor. I bet you cannot do recursion here. Yes, I can. Can I run Doom? Hmm? <laughs> 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 can I run Doom? Can I run Doom, the game Doom that everyone tries to make any kind of device run Doom? Mm. Is it okay, so there, there are two really big limitations to this thing. One has to do with uh, all registers are only 8-bit wide, which also means you can, I can only really address a memory space that is 8-bit wide, okay? So that's one limitation. The second limitation is I only got four registers, which is really, really a bare minimum of number of registers. So, you know, for, to do anything meaningful, you have to kind of do a lot of swapping. Okay, this register, oh, okay, we need it back, so store the content over here, so can we use the register and so on. So by expanding the instruction set to 32-bit, then I got all the room, all the space that I need to run do, for instance. <laughs> but the processor can still be as simple as this. In other words, as far as how the whole thing connects the control signals and whatnot, it can be remaining as just this. Increasing the width of the instructions and also the, the width of memory location to 32-bit just allows me to address Four gigabytes or four giga locate four billion locations instead of 256. <coughs> it, it's a scaling issue, not a capability issue. Everything that I can do here is already enough to implement any C code. It's just that with 256 locations, you can only implement so much code because of that limit. Is that okay? So later on in this class, and we only got five minutes you know, before noon, but later on, you know, what we'll do is we'll start to write code in assembly code for this particular processor. We'll start with hand translating everything into binary code first because that's part of the fun and part of the reason why you would start to appreciate the assembler. <laughs> okay, and then we'll start to write uh, code in assembly language, which is a little bit easier. The assembler is already done in the form of a spreadsheet. So I have a Google spreadsheet that is doing the job of an assembler. So you give it the symbolic code, it will crank out the actual content that you can save into a RAM file. Then you right click on the RAM, you say load image, and then you can, you can, then you can run the program. Yep, so the whole thing is pretty much as open source it, as it can possibly be. <laughs> the only component that is not open source is Google Spreadsheet itself. All right, so that, that's kind of the roadmap you know, of the entire thing. So next time on Wednesday, we'll start to look into some really simple instructions like, oh, I need to know what is the next instruction to execute. Where do I find it? And how do I execute that instruction? So we'll start with that on Wednesday. So there's